Welcome to another episode of Tiffin Box TV. I'm your host, Seishu. And you guys know I speak with photography industry leaders who make it a habit of inspiring others, bridging craft and commerce to help you create a sustainable and creative business. Today's guest is John Morales, who's a photographer based in San Diego, and he has inspired me. Well, he'll never know to what end, but trust me, this guy is amazing. He's a photographer who has got a new project that he's kicking off called Neighbors. It's not really new, but it's it's one where he's going to be, well, we're going to talk about what he's going to do in a little bit, but he has come here to talk a little bit about what inspired him to start this project and where it's, he's going to take it. Welcome to the show, John. Hey, hi, hi, it's actually happy to be here. Awesome, man. Hey, listen, you know, as, as I've indicated, <clears throat> your work stands out uh, like nobody else's that I can think of. I mean, you have a very unique way of photographing people, lighting people, interacting with people, everything. I mean, uh, I think I remember seeing some of your work from Burning Man and I was like, whoa, whoa, how did you do that? Or it could be something from, I don't know, the oil fields or of uh, Nebraska. Is it, is it Nebraska or North Dakota? I can't remember where. North Dakota. North, North Dakota, Dakota, where you were spent, you know, just really going on the road and photographing complete strangers and getting them so comfortable in front of your camera. And that's that's a skill in itself. But let's talk about your project called Neighbors, right? Tell us a little bit about how it got started, what has what you've done with it. Um, well, let me just take a step back, first of all. Please, I think we've please. Got, yeah, we've known each other since the days of the Digital Wedding Forum. That's right. Uh, and um, uh, so, you know, my background is doing commercial photography, and then I started shooting weddings uh, for about 10 years. And throughout that, what I've always believed in, and one of the things I've always preached, whether I'm talking at WPPI or on the forum or just individual photographers, is the idea that you have to, to maintain uh, yourself create, creatively. You always have to be pushing yourself creatively and doing personal work because personal work opens up all kinds of doors and it really prevents uh, not only burnout on an emotional sense but on a financial sense because a lot of photographers – you know what happens, especially in the wedding industry. They get stuck doing the same thing over and over again, and then all of a sudden, somebody comes into town who is younger than them, undercuts their price, and next thing you know, you know they're they're not booking any weddings, and they they don't have anywhere to turn. And a big part of the reason why is because they've allowed themselves to stagnate creatively. And so, one thing I've always done throughout my career, um, sometimes more successfully than others, is push myself to be taking on new projects. And Neighbors is my newest project. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned my work in the Bakken oil fields of North Dakota. Um, that was probably my first like really big, uh, like, you know, like uh, what James uh, Collin, uh, Jim Collins uh, would call a BHAG, which is a big, hairy, audacious goal. Uh, in his book, From Good to Great, he, he talks about companies that made the transition from being a, a good company to a great company, a company like IBM, Philip Morris, um, Motorola. And he says that great companies set BHAGs, which are big, hairy, audacious goals. Their goal, you don't, they don't know if they can succeed, but if they do, it'll, it'll, it'll be big. And so going, for me, going to the, north, uh, the oil fields of North Dakota, where I didn't know a soul, I didn't know where I was going in this kind of wild west, um, was exciting and I, I was able to succeed and, and it really gave me a lot of encouragement. And then what I did is I took that work to a, a world, sort of a market where I'd never uh, previously ever engaged with and that's the fine art world or I should say the art world. Um, and because uh, I've always shot weddings, I've shot, I've shot for Fortune 500 companies, I've worked with ad, ad campaigns, with companies, very comfortable on the commercial side of things but then there's this whole art world where you have galleries and museum curators and the related uh, magazines and all that. And I'd never done anything. I'd never taken that world seriously. But then I decided, okay, that's the one nut I haven't cracked. You know, let's see how I do here. And I began to show my work to that world and really had no idea what reception I'd receive. And I sat down and started showing my work. I went to a portfolio review, an organized portfolio review here in San Diego. And right away, the reception was strong. Uh, nobody offered me a show. Nobody offered to, uh, to sell my work. But 
I, I was received as um, someone who had something to contribute within that world. And so that gave me a lot of confidence, and I took on other projects. And so fast forward to Neighbors. Um, Neighbors is really a case of me, um, and it sound, may sound kind of trite, but making lemonade out of lemons. Um, I had moved to a neighborhood. Um, I purchased a house in a neighborhood called Logan Heights, and it's a predominantly Hispanic and African-American uh, neighborhood, mostly lower income. Um, I guess you could call me a gentrifier. Actually, I want to get a T-shirt that says gentrifier. Um, but I bought this house, fixed it up, made it really nice inside and out. Um, but all the, all the hip, cool stuff was in the other neighborhoods, right? I have to drive to get food. I have to drive to go to a coffee shop. I have to drive to go to the cool hipster bars, to the, the brew pubs. There's none of that in my neighborhood. And I love the people in my neighborhood, but there was nobody really, you know, uh, kind of middle class urban like me in my neighborhood. So I was feeling a little isolated and a little sort of sorry for myself. And I, and I began to think, well, what do I have here? And I had actually made a fence. Um, I had built a fence, this very sort of hipster, modern fence. And I looked at it, that and I thought, you know what? I could put photos on that fence. And I'm on a busy corner. So I thought people will see whatever I put on there. And I began to scheme, like, what could I do there? And around the same time, um, one of my uh, neighbors uh, took me. He's like, hey, John, get in the car. And uh, uh, he's this black guy, and, and uh, uh, he's kind of adopted me in a, in a way. And so we, we jump in his car, and we go to this bar. And it was kind of dead, and it, but it was just all – it was a, a purely black crowd there. And I was a little bit out of my element, but I started taking some pictures. It was dead, so we go to another place, which is a uh, – it was um, – I think it was a veteran of foreign wars um, hall, and everybody in there is black. And they were dressed impeccably. I mean, it was, you know, I, I couldn't believe how, how they were dressed. The suits that were perfectly matching and the pocket squares and the hats and the shoes. And, and there was this whole, first there was two things. One, there was this whole black culture that existed that I was completely unaware of as a white person coming from sort of, you know, typical white middle class culture. And, and just the way they looked was amazing. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to come back here, I'm going to photograph. And so I got permission and I came back and photographed the next week. And so I now I begin to have a collection of portraits. And the idea to sort of jump like, hey, if I take these photos from the neighborhood, put them up on my fence, that I think is going to make a strong statement. It's really going to empower the neighborhood. Um, you know, and, and then what I can do and this was from a very early point, is I wanted to then, once all these photos were up, bring attention to the fence, bring all my white friends into the black Hispanic neighborhood where they're afraid to go because I mean, people are like, hey, am I going to get shot if I go into your neighborhood? And it's like, no, you're not going to get shot. Everybody's great here. This is, it's a safe neighborhood. The people are super friendly. So what a lot of people, what a lot of art is about is putting art up in a gallery wall in a safe place where white people go to talk about these important issues that are happening around the world. And so I said, well, let's break that down. Let's bring them actually to the community. Let's just not talk about integration. Let's actually create integration where I'm going to bring people who wouldn't come into this neighborhood and then, you know, they can, they can meet, you know, genuine people of color. And so not only was the art part of the project, but the physical bringing of people together became a very important part of this project. And so I began to accumulate more photos. I, I photographed on the street in my neighborhood. Um, you know, uh, my neighborhood is historically black, but there's been a large influx of Hispanic people over the past 20 years. So I tried to mix it up. But um, for me, you know, I, I kind of uh, I enjoyed working with my African American friends here and, and neighbors. So they're kind of predominant part of the wall, but there's a mix. And so that's how it started. And, and I didn't have a name for it until maybe just uh, a few weeks before it was ready to go. And I, I brainstormed and finally neighbors is like that kind of. Yeah. Um, it's a, it's a perfect it title for what you're trying to do. And interestingly, you, you know, the, the project that sort of inspired this one was in North Dakota, which is several thousand miles away probably from where you are 
And this is really right around the corner from where you are. I mean, this is right in your neighborhood. I mean, that's why it's, it's, it's significant in that you've taken the idea of photographing strangers you know, in a far off place and said, why not just do this right here in my own hometown? And you've had great success with it. The project, uh, I, there's, a, there's a video that I'm gonna link to or probably even embed within this blog post where you show how you actually put these prints, large prints together on the on a fence on your fence, and mm -hmm. it's like it's not it's not a, a one day thing. It's like it's an ongoing project where you have to have a few carpentry skills perhaps to put things together, <laughs> right? Well, uh, I, well you, you you sling that uh, tool belt real nicely, you know. So I figured you have you've had you've had to have done this before in some capacity, um, but let me ask you this let me ask you this in, when it came to actually photographing these strangers and i think we hinted at how uh, comfortable you've made people feel first talk to us uh, or walk us through your process in approaching people you absolutely don't know and saying hey listen i want to take your photograph is it as simple as just asking them hey can i take your picture or is it more of a, a of a well, couch conversation and then you just drop it in you know n well okay so you've touched on a really important point and I think I have uh, good photographic skills um, but one thing I possess that is key to this whole project is the ability to make people feel comfortable very quickly I got unprecedented access to the oil fields of North Dakota in part because I was able to sweet talk people and make people feel very comfortable I talked to the senior photo editor for National Geographic, and it took her photographer, who's one of the top uh, documentary photographers in the world, bar none, took him three months to get access to an, uh, a working oil field. It took me about four or five days to get that same access. You know, it's because, first of all, I'm determined. I can sweet talk people. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm willing to accept no. I get a lot of no's. And, and for a lot of people, it's very disheartening to be told no time after time and you just have to, to accept that. But so talking about what I actually do is um, I have seconds to break through to somebody because when I walk up to somebody, they, uh, they think I'm going to sell them something. And so they put up their defenses. And here, it's a lot of, I'm a, I'm a psychology major. I, I studied cognitive psychology at the University of California in Santa Barbara. And so I kind of approach it from this perspective. But what's really interesting is if I approach a middle-class white person, a, a male white person, the chances are much higher of them saying no than if I'm approaching somebody who's, uh, say, African-American. And, and so what I've come to realize is that there's a, a hierarchy within society, and white males are at the top, and, and they have something to lose. They don't want – they're at the top, and so – What's going to happen? What do they have to gain by me photographing them? And, hmm. and they don't have much to gain, right? And, and, but they have something to lose, which is their, the, the prestige, the respect, whatever it might be. People on the lower rungs of society have less to lose, and they're more likely to say yes. So I kind of, you know, there's a little bit of stereotyping going on here, but it's born of experience. So I know kind of, I, I tailor my pitch a little bit to who I'm dealing with, where I'm, I'm shooting. If I'm in a lower income area, in many ways it's, it's much easier. Uh, if I'm in a place where there's a connection uh, to what I'm doing, for example, I was recently photographing in, in Chicano Park, and it was Chip Chicano Park Day, and people know that you know, they're there to look at the lowrider cars and they're, they're kind of dressed up a little bit. And so they're like, yeah, I'm, I'm here to be seen and be seen, and they were all very receptive. But if I'm in a corner gas station in the middle of Virginia, um, approaching farmers, you know, I have to walk up to them and I'm literally at a gas station. I set up my, my, my lights in a backdrop and, and they're filling up their car. And I, as they're filling up, I'm like, hi, my name's John Morellis. I'm a photographer from San Diego and I'm working on a project to photograph Americans across the country. And I'd like to take your picture, you know, and it's like, I, I have, and I have to say it with a smile. I've got seconds to, to deliver my message. And then I say, there's no charge. Um, and I'm happy to give you the photo afterwards. So I, I let them know that I'm, they're not being sold anything. And, and um, you know, and then sometimes if, th th here's the key, if they even hesitate a second, 
they know that I will get them. And so, uh, you know, if they're going to say no, they just have to shut down completely. Like, no, I'm not interested. Thank you. And then they put up this barrier. But if they're like, well, and then I'm like, come on, you know, you want your photo taken. And, and that's when I turn on the charm, turn on the smile. And I go, just take a second. You can fill up your car. By the time you're done filling up, I'll have you back here. You can go off to work, whatever it is. And if they let their guard down for a second, I can get them. So that's people are, you know, it, it's like they, they you know, uh, they have to keep that guard up if they want to say no. There's a lot of psychology involved. Um, and, and there's a lot of me putting myself out there. And it, after a day of shooting like this, it's a mentally, uh, emotionally kind of spent. I'm sure. I'm sure. Uh, have you ever had anybody uh, decline the offer after you've photographed them saying, hey, listen, I don't like the photograph you just shot. Do you ever show these photographs to people? I, I rarely show the photos to okay. people. I mean, occasionally I'll show them. Right. But, you know, then the deal is done and, and people, they're, you know, they might chat a little bit more like, what is, what is it you're actually doing here? And then you know, I'll explain to them. And, um, but, uh, you know, I've made, there's been people who I thought, okay, I'm not, they're not going to let me photograph them. And they do. And they're really wonderful, uh, sweet people. You know, they kind of put off a gruff exterior. But then once they, they let me in, you know, they want to share. They want to talk. One of the interesting things, so uh, in, in the Bakken, in the oil fields of North Dakota, I did a series of these portraits. And these guys, they're tough on the outside, but they're 1,000, 2,000 miles away from home. Yeah. They, they, many of them have lost everything in the Great Recession. I, mean, I was photographing there three years ago, so it was still, um, you know, things were still kind of tough. But and they had been out there for a couple of years. They had turned their lives around, but they wanted to tell their story. And it was really amazing to me how many people were, you know, you asked them one question, and boom, it just came out. Um, it was. Uh, uh, they they wear their stories on their sleeves. So sometimes the out, sometimes the outside toughness is there as a facade, and and you know I just break through it. Awesome. Uh, one of the things I've always been interested in uh, or intrigued by is that given the fact that you talk to so many people, uh, is there a chance or an opportunity for you to record their stories in ways other than a photograph? I mean, do you do you have an audio recorder? Uh, recording what they're saying in their own sort of vernacular, or do you find uh, perhaps a you know a, fr a friend of yours who could do some videos behind the scenes to so sort of get a sense of how you approach people and and talk to people and how do you, how you photograph them and get their stories. I mean, really get their stories. Uh, I'm thinking along the lines of story core or, or something like that. You know? Yeah. Well, so um, when I'm working in a gas station or at a gas station, getting people. I mean, I. They're just like, you know, they come, they go. Um, I don't really have time to interview them. But having said that, uh, one of the things I am investing in for my coming road trip um, is several GoPros. And I will be, I'll put a uh, GoPro on my hat um, so I can record some of these interactions. I'll set up a GoPro on a, like a light stand or something so it can re record some of this. Awesome. And then I am go going to get contact information for some of these people um, so I can follow up and tell the story. For example, on my blog, on my uh, jraymondmorellis.com slash blog um, uh, section of my website, I recently put up the story of Chuko, who uh, I, I got his information and I followed up. And, you know, I, basically everything in there is, is his words. I just sort of combined it and, and strung it together. And it's a really powerful, interesting story. Uh, Amazing story. Amazing yeah. story, Yes. So I'm not going to do that with everybody, but sure. I think I will do it with some people because I think it also it helps connect, uh, you know, further the connection between what I'm doing and and the audience. Awesome. Uh, let's jump right into the the project, which uh, you're uh, you know gunning to go around the country and photograph people at gas stations or other places. Tell us a little bit about what you're planning on doing with this neighbors project. Now it's now that you've You've launched it in San Diego. Are, are you moving it on to other cities across the country? Is that the idea? Yeah. I, so um, I started in San Diego, and mm -hmm. then I I was uh, I work with a group called Culture Runners, and you can find it at uh, culturerunners.com. Um, maybe you can provide that. Uh, Absolutely. The spelling's a little funky. Um, and uh, so we travel in an RV across the country uh, with a group of artists, uh, mostly from the Middle East. 
And so I began shooting some of these portraits along the way. And so I was going to different states, and then the idea struck me, why don't I take this to all 50 states? That would be amazing. I'm still kind of scared by the idea because it's a lot of work. Um, but I thought, you know, if I can pull this off, it would, um, it would be a body of work that would, would be monumental both for me uh, and also I think, you know, for, for um, within the context of photography and art. So I've, uh, uh, I've got a, a motorhome and um, I, I'm going to spend two weeks on the road from Houston to Memphis and then down uh, to New Orleans. I'm leaving at, um, uh, at the end of this month, be gone for two weeks, and then I come back and then I hit the road and I'm going to tour the western U.S. Uh, from here to Washington to Montana, Idaho, Utah. If I have the energy, I may push forward and continue all the way to Maine, or I may come back and uh, kind of get everything together and then set out towards Maine uh, at the end of summer and then in the fall, winter, um, uh, take the southern route and head down to Florida. Um, heat and, I don't do well in the heat and humidity, so I'll leave that for the, uh, for the, the, for the winter months, I'm sure. Yeah, exactly. Uh, t talk to us a little bit about how you are planning on choosing where to stop and do these photo shoots. I mean, I'm always intrigued by those kinds of decisions. You know, what is it that inspires you? Is it just the location? Is it just knowing somebody in the in the in the community that says, "Okay, we're going to have you come here and set up shop," and uh, I promise you, there's going to be at least twenty, thirty people who would be phenomenal for you to photograph. How are you making those decisions on where to stop? Well, um, I don't know. <laughs> okay, okay, fair enough. <laughs> no. Um... You know, I, I was looking at the, on the map and saying, you know, for example, uh, north of L.A., there's a town called Bakersfield. And Bakersfield is a great mix. Of, there's a lot of uh, farm workers there who I think are an, an important, uh, you know, it's like kind of piecing a puzzle together. So I want to get the farm workers. There's also a lot of uh, oil workers uh, in the area. Uh, and there's farmers and there's, there's ranchers. And so I think, you know, it's a good uh, sort of uh, representation of, you know, of, uh, of the West in California. And so then, you know, heading up maybe, uh, to North of Sacramento, we have a lot of organic farmers, um, and, uh, San Francisco where you have the hippies and you have the tech workers. And so I kind of look at like, okay, well, you know, what's going on within the geographic area, what's sort of representative and then, you know, okay, maybe a college town, maybe, uh, uh, a, you know, there's a town, there's a logging town, you know, getting kind of some of the archetypes of um, of the, that particular region, and and then sometimes it's just like, hey, you know what? This looks like a good spot. This looks like a great gas station. You know, what are great are gas stations that are at the, the intersection of four corners, kind of in the middle of nowhere. And gas stations are great because everybody has to stop for gas. Rich people, poor people, they all come through the corner gas station. Um, and then, you know, uh, for example, my brother works for FedEx in, in Memphis. I'm going to be traveling to Memphis um, in a couple weeks. And he said, hey, would you like to photograph the, the guys who are loading the, the planes at, you know, three in the morning that make mm -hmm. this economy work? Sure. Um, and so, you know, then there's offers like that that come up. Would, would, you know, how about this? How about that? And I think that's going to be an important part of the mix. Because what I don't want to do is just be at the, the street corner, you know, it's great if I can be at some place like a rodeo or maybe a Sunday church in a small community in the middle of Nebraska. And, because what I'm really trying to do is get the, the physical and cultural center of America. It's really easy to photograph the people at the extremes, right? The odd people, the really poor people. Poor people, you know, the, the homeless. In a way, they're easy to photograph because, like I said, they have nothing to lose. They, they want the attention. But it's that middle class who, you know, or the middle of America who we, we tend to ignore unless there's something stressful happening, right? If a hurricane comes through or, or um, you know, the water supply goes south, like in Flint, Michigan. But, you know, if it's people just living their ordinary lives and, and um, finding that which is interesting, that which is heroic, that which is common to us all that inspires us or, or you know... Uh, you know, that we can learn from. Um, not always positive, but, you know, that's what I'm interested in. So 
it's about piecing this puzzle together in, in you know, however I, I can do it and not just in a random way. Awesome. Uh, let's talk about very quickly the, uh, the thing that you are, I guess, giving away for those who are supporting this project. The first thing that you're, I guess, including is uh, a magazine. Talk to us about the, the Neighbors magazine. What is it, what is it gonna include? What, is, what does it involve, really? Well, um, so let me just say that I'm, I've got a GoFundMe campaign. And uh, as you can imagine, traveling across the country in a motorhome uh, that gets eight uh, miles to the gallon uh, is not cheap. Um, <laughs> You know, I figure I'll log at least 15,000 miles on this trip. So uh, I've launched a GoFundMe campaign so that people can contribute and help out. I think this is going to be a, a really uh, amazing project and, and a worthwhile one. And so uh, to sweeten the pot, I've created um, uh, a 20-page magazine that I'm giving away. Contribute 30 bucks, you get this magazine, and I sign it. And I guarantee you... Once this is all said and done, this thing's going to be a collector's item. Um, so it'll be well worth the money you spent. But for me, it's not just a magazine that I'm giving out. What I, what I do is when I lay it out, I put two images side by side that might be people who are similar or people who are different and radically different. But then you see them side by side and you see the similarities and you see the differences. And there's this 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 thing that happens that is greater than the sum of its parts. You know, you begin to understand America. You begin to understand Americans. You begin to understand our cultural differences, our similarities, our economic differences. I mean, it's just kind of, it, there's a little magic that happens when you place two images side by side. So for me, in an artistic level, um, laying this, this magazine out is really kind of uh, the end goal because then this is a step towards a future book. Um, and, and my book, Inspiration, I have to, to shout out to Richard Avedon, uh, his book, In the American West, is really the inspiration for this project. And so, you know, that's, um, it's an inspiration, it's a goal, and I want to be able to live up to that standard. And, and so when I see the work put together, it, it kind of gives me goosebumps in a way because it's the path towards, you know, a book that hopefully can inspire future generations of photographers and Americans. Awesome. Uh, last question for you. Uh, when it comes to uh, photographing, whether it's in, at a gas station, uh, I'm assuming you're asking for permission first uh, and setting your, your gear and lights and things like that up. Uh, but when it comes to being outdoors and photographing outdoors, whether it's uh, with weather being an issue or just really being in a neighborhood that you are not really, you know, you're, you're essentially a <laughs> foreigner, uh, yeah. you, you could be easily picked off in a way, you know, how are you planning on securing yourself being outdoors? Uh, well, uh, I have always depended on the kindness of strangers. There you go. Uh, awesome. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I was in, uh, Palestine, Texas, uh, at this little dive, um, uh, restaurant and it was like a little gambling joint and I was with, with my culture runners crew and they just left me and, you know, there's like, some hustlers, some, you know, and I don't know, there's drug deals going on. I mean, and I'm there by myself and I shoot with a Hasselblad H5, which, you know, it's a $10,000 camera and each lens is a couple thousand. I shoot with pro photo gear. I mean, I got twenty twenty five thousand dollars sitting there on the street, you know, and, uh, uh, and I'm all by myself. So, um, you know, what I found though is that, um, I, it's really important to make friends. I'll tell you one of the times I was most scared as a photographer was working in a bar in North Dakota on a Friday night because in North Dakota, there's no women. There's, you know, people go out, the, the guys go out and they get drunk and, you know, uh, they're, uh, you know, so there's nothing to do but fight, you know, and guy coming in from out of town, you know, I don't know anybody there, easy to pick a fight. Uh, and so what I did consciously is I engaged every single person in that bar who was in my area. So if I was photographing you, but there was a guy behind you, I had already in my, introduced myself to that guy behind you so that, you know, I was friends with everybody. And if somebody was going to pick on me, you know, and I've had people tell me, Hey, if anybody gives you a hard time, I've got your back. So, awesome. um, it's really just, uh, 
you know, instead of like going in with, I'm going to protect myself, it's like, I'm going to open myself up to everybody here. And if you're friends with people, you know, they respect that. Awesome. Great answer, uh, John. Thank you so much for uh, inspiring me personally uh, on what your mission right now. I mean, I think it's phenomenal that you're doing this and I, I wish you the very best. Um, I will have this uh, on my blog, of course. So uh, consider this as a sort of a semi-promotional uh, interview in a way. Uh, you are doing this to advance, obviously, your creative skills. You're, you're flexing your creative muscles and traveling across the country. Um, if there's anything at all that Tiffin Box can do or I can do, please reach out and let, let me know. I appreciate it. Um, yeah. Can I just say one more thing before yes, we sign Yes, please. Go off? ahead. Yeah. And, and that's, a, that's a message to uh, all the viewers. Um, you know, I've always, and I, as I said at the beginning, I've always uh, recommended that photographers have personal projects. And I think every photographer should have a book that they're working on. You know, it, it can be just a, a one-off book made by Blurb. I do Blurb books all the time um, just for my own, own purpose because once you begin going down this, this path – all kinds of doors open up, both creatively and professionally. And so if there's anything that my experience can, can, can teach or in, inspire, it's that everybody, you know, whether it's big or small, it could be right in your backyard. Everybody should have uh, a book project or personal project. Awesome. John, wishing you well, wishing you the best, and good luck with your project. I will have links to the GoFundMe page as well as the uh, the magazine that you have, uh, that you're, you're including as part of uh, People's Donation. Thank you very much. Awesome. All right. Thank Th you. Take care, bud. Bye. Mm -hmm.